Hi, welcome to History 1301. This is U.S. History up to 1877. My name is Alfonso R. Lopez, and I will be your instructor for this class this summer session. Now, what we're going to be doing in this recorded video presentation is to go over the syllabus. Uh, consider this as the very first day of class. So if you will be taking, for example, uh, a class in person, this is the day, the first day of class where you meet the instructor and the instructor is going to explain everything that you need to know about this course. Uh, we're going to go over some of the technical information, for example, uh, course requirements, for example, what is uh, the textbook that is required for this course, uh, what is the course content, uh, in other words, what are the themes, uh, the material that we're going to cover, uh, what is the method of instruction as well, uh, and as you can see, uh, this is something I, I will explain in more detail um, in just a few moments is that um, the instruction is going to be based just like this, again, in recorded video sessions like this or lectures. Um, so we're also going to look at uh, exams, how the exams are going to be formatted, how can you prepare for them and such. Uh, we're going to be talking also about uh, a course assignment. This is due at the end of the term, really towards the end. Uh, there will be one assignment that is due or a report for that matter. Um, we're going to be talking also about extra credit assignments as well. Um, and so uh, this is going to really provide a very good guidance and orientation about uh, the course, how to prepare for the exams, what kind of assignments they're going to be, and also um, identify the major areas of Blackboard as well, because this is the platform that we're going to be using for this course for all the instruction is going to be Blackboard. So having said that, let us turn our attention to Blackboard again. And this course has uh, two sections. So if you're enrolled, for example, in 1301 section 012, or if you're enrolled in section uh, 019, it is really the same course. It's identical. It's just two different sections. So let us just um, open any one of those. Once again, it doesn't matter which section you're enrolled. Uh, this is the same uh, course. So uh, I send you an email over the weekend uh, indicating that there will be a video presentation that will be uploaded on Tuesday. And once this recording is ready, I'm going to send you uh, an email notification for you to review. And it is very, very important that you review this video presentation because um, it's going to just clear up many of the doubts and questions that you have about this course. Uh, as a matter of fact, many of the questions that students send me across the semester or across the summer term uh, have to uh, can be answered by just simply going back to uh, the video presentation. But of course, I respond to their questions in emails, uh, messages, and so on. But in reality, most of the information that students uh, ask me across the semester can be found um, in, in the class introduction. So let us turn to our syllabus. You can see uh, the menu on the left column. Uh, the first link, as you can see, is syllabus. If you click on it, uh, you can read the entire syllabus there. Okay, so I made it I made it quite simple for you to identify the syllabus and for you to actually just read it, you know, as, as soon as you click on the link. And this is what we're going to be doing in this video presentation, going over the syllabus, because the syllabus really explains it all. So uh, let me explain it to you step by step, starting from the very top. Again, so this is uh, History 1301, U.S. History, 
up to 1877. So this is the very first uh, half of US history. Um, this is a 10 week course, summer course, that will span from May 28th all the way to August 4th, okay? My name is Alfonso R. Lopez, and the fastest and easiest way to reach me is via email com communication, okay? Uh, my email is listed there, as you can see. Um, and also keep in mind that according to ACC policy, all electronic communication between faculty and students must take place through the official college supply systems. Okay, so what that means is that if you send me an email from your private account, I'm not going to respond to it, okay, because this is ACC policy. If you want a quick response, it will be best, again, this is ACC policy that you email me from your ACC email account, okay? And I will respond within a 24 hour period, Monday through Friday, okay? So Monday through Friday is a 24 hour period, I will respond. Uh, and it is only during the weekends that I might take 48 hours. So let's just say that uh, if you send the email, let it just say on a Saturday, uh, for sure you will be receiving a response Monday morning. Um, and that is because at times uh, I have to leave town, attend uh, emergencies or family matters, for example, or conferences, etc. So again, uh, the weekends might be a little bit difficult to respond within a 24 hour period. I will try though, I will try to do that. Uh, but again, for sure, um, Monday morning, you will be receiving a response from me if you send it during uh, over the weekend. Also, uh, it, it will be best if you can, in the subject, uh, in the heading of the email or in the message when you're writing, for example, a question, that you can actually state which class are you enrolled. Okay, It will just, again, made it, make it so mo much easier, again, for me. Okay. All right, so that's as far as uh, communication is concerned. Now, there's going to be a required textbook for this course. Um, it is stated stated there, as you can see, is a book by Michael Scharer and other authors. Um, it is called Reading American Horizons, Primary Sources for U.S. History in a Global Context, Volume 1. So make sure you're getting Volume 1 because this is the first half of U.S. history. And also make sure you're getting the fourth edition. It's very important uh, because this is a book that you're going to need to complete the course assignment that is due at the end of the term. It is a report. I'm, I'm going to talk more about that once we get to that point. Uh, so this is not really the standard textbook that you get in a class where you can, you know, just read from cover to cover that there's a narrative of historical events and such. This is a collection of documents, historical records, in other words, documents that were written directly by historical actors. So there's no mediator and there's no author that is interpreting that document for you. So those can be memoirs or letters or certain laws that were passed, for example, by certain colonies, etc. Statements uh, produced by kings and so on. So you're going to hear the voice directly from the historical actor. And as I will explain in just a few moments, the report is going to ask you a series of questions about that. Okay, so why do you need this textbook to complete that assignment okay so that is why you need this uh this 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 textbook and it's a thin it's a thin textbook this is the actual reader or companion to the actual textbook that we're not going to be using again so the textbook is about three four hundred pages we're not going to use that and it has a companion or a reader a collection of documents this is the one that you're supposed to be getting is again 
an investment of anywhere between $20, $25 at max. Uh, you can get this textbook at the ACC bookstore at Highland campus. And that is the campus that actually sells this uh, textbook. And I highly recommend that you buy this, tech, this textbook as soon as you can uh, because it is almost like a standard procedure by the ACC bookstores that at some point uh, when students, for example, wait for so long, let us just say at midpoint of the semester, or in this case, at midpoint of the term, uh, if students wait until the very end, again, to buy the textbook, they're not going to buy it there. They're not going to get it because the textbook actually um, is sent back to the vendor. Okay, uh, The ACC bookstore actually returns all the unsold copies uh, back to the vendor because they assume that students actually bought that textbook somewhere else. Okay, So... Uh, that, that often happens around mid, midpoint of, of the term. So if this is going to be a 10-week uh, session, that means that in about four or five weeks, uh, they're going to start sending back those textbooks. Okay? So if I were you, I will buy that textbook within the next two or three weeks, again, just to make sure that you get it um, and you start working on that assignment. Okay, you don't want to be working on that assignment towards the end of the term. Again, uh, it, as you'll see, it's, it's, it's going to consist about 25% of the final grade. So you want to make sure you're, you're going to uh, complete this assignment as thoroughly as possible. Not in a rush. Okay, so this course is offered online, fully online, in a asynchronous format, which means that there's no designated class meetings for real-time instruction, okay? So this is a very, very convenient um, course format that allows for students to review the material in their own schedule at their own pace. Uh, of course, uh, there is a certain rhythm that you must keep you know, in, in order not to fall behind, but uh, there will be no fixed class meetings, again, that you have to worry about, okay? So this is a quite a plus, especially when you have other duties and responsibilities, okay? Now, in terms of the course description or the course content, what we're going to be covering uh, in this course, as I mentioned, this is the first half of U.S. history that is going to cover a great deal of material because uh, our story is going to begin in the ancient world and even before the ancient world, even before recorded history, that is to say, okay? Uh, we're going to look at, for example, when we look at ancient history, we're going to look at the background of the United States, starting with, first and foremost, the Native Americans, okay? Uh, we're going to look at the Native American world, the indigenous inhabitants of the American continent, uh, where the indigenous peoples came from. At least we're going to look at some of the theories regarding that. Um, and we're going to also look at their migration patterns where certain groups settled and then began forming their very complex and highly sophisticated cultures and civilizations. So we're going to identify the major civilizations that flourished in the American continent, uh, looking at some of their characteristics, for example, their religious ideas, their religious beliefs and practices, ceremonies, rituals, etc. We're going to look at their social organization. We're going to also look at some of their political structures as well. Um, and also, we're going to look at the collapse of those civilizations around the year 900 AD. Um, the major civilizations that flourished in the American continent came to an end, again, 
pretty much all of them at the same time uh, around the year 900 AD. By that time, again, all of those civilizations had collapsed. We're going to look at the reasons why that occurred in preparation for looking at, for example, the kind of world that came after 900 AD that Christopher Columbus encountered when he arrived to the Americans in 1492. Okay, so with that, what that means is that we're also going to look, when we look at ancient history, at the European background of U.S. history, because the United States, of course, is a composite of many different cultures. One of them deal with indigenous peoples and societies of the Americas, but uh, the other deals with the European world as well. The European societies, the European cultures that arrived to the Americas to start settling and colonizing the continent. And that requires for us to also look at the European background as well. That, that means that we will look at uh, the origins of European civilization going back to the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans quite briefly. We're not going to provide an exhaustive presentation of the ancient Greeks and Romans, just you know, kind of identify some of their major contributions to European culture and society. We're going to look at the development of European history after the fall of Rome, uh, looking at the Middle Ages, for example, uh, the Renaissance. And it, in that Renaissance uh, that started around the 1300s, 12th, 13th, 1300s, uh, we're going to start looking at uh, the age of discovery, how the Europeans are going to initiate a new era, not only within European history, but also in global history. And it's called the age of discovery. We're going to see the development of uh, very and highly advanced navigation systems and technologies that the Europeans were using in order to explore the world around them. And we're going to look at the background of that, and the background of the age of discovery. What led Europeans to start stepping outside their own region in order to explore bodies of water and continents and provide more accurate descriptions of the world and maps, etc., which eventually led to the discovery of America by Columbus. So uh, the whole background of this has to do with the emergence of international trade, okay? the emergence of international commerce. Uh, the world was becoming more interconnected commercially, you know, something that accelerated around the 1200s onwards when the Europeans were reaching out to uh, the Far East in search for spices and silks and gold, etc. Again, that really started linking the world together. So it was really the need to accelerate the pace of trade uh, that led the Europeans to start improving upon their navigation systems. They wanted to have larger cargo ships or vessels uh, that will bring more and more merchandise from faraway lands, whether it's from China, from India, or Africa, etc. Et and that led again to the age of discovery. You know, that led to uh, Columbus trying to find a uh, shortcut to the Far East by navigating westward. And in doing so, he stumbled upon new land, in this case, this new continent that was named later on as America. And with that initiates the age of encounters, okay? the encounters between different civilizations. It was not just the Europeans and the Native Americans encountering one another, uh, the Europeans and the Africans were also encountering one another on a more permanent basis. And also the Europeans were moving into the Far East, as I mentioned. And again, this begins what is called the process of globalization. The early stages of a globalized world begins uh, around the, uh, the 13 and 1400s AD. And so we're going to examine uh, those encounters, the encounters between the Europeans and the natives, and 
uh, we're going to assess some of the reasons, the forces that propelled Europeans to move into the American continent and settle. Uh, the early process of colonization, that is. Um, so in this course, we're going to be paying attention to that. And to do that, we're going to look at two major forces uh, that pushed Europeans out of Europe into the American continent. One is going to be economics. Of course, uh, the idea that, well, this new continent provided more land, you know, more available land for agriculture, for farming, um, the, uh, a land that provided also an overabundance of natural resources and so on that could be commercialized and traded for gold. This is something that drove Europeans in large numbers to the American continent. Again, in fact, the formation of all of the colonies across the Americas, whether those were formed by Spain or Portugal, France or Holland or Great Britain or England, uh, all of those colonies were formed mainly to serve the economic needs and interests of the mother country in Europe. Again, uh, so again, remember, this is the era of international trade. So we're going to see a great number of investors and merchants and companies arriving into the American continent in order to settle and start extracting again the wealth whether it was gold and silver or other natural resources uh, to Europe for Europe to trade it around the world for gold so again economics is going to be one of the reasons that we're going to be exploring in this class of why the Europeans settled in the new world but also the other force that pushed Europeans out of Europe was religion we're going to see also large numbers of people coming into the American continent, uh, mostly fleeing religious persecution back in their kingdoms. In this case, we're going to be paying attention exclusively to England. Again, and so we're going to see mainly Protestants, a large number of Protestant Christians arriving to North America in order to create what they believe to be uh, the utopian societies, Christian societies that were ideal, perfect for them. In other words, uh, they wanted to practice their religion in total isolation from Europe, but at the same time create, again, an ideal society. So we're going to look at that as well in this course. Then our story is going to be moving into the colonial period itself, um, from the 1600s all the way to the end of the colonial period, you know, with the American Revolution, we're going to be looking at major, major forces that are shaping colonial society um, in North America. For example, uh, one of those uh, forces was the slave trade. Okay, so we're going to look at the reasons why the slave trade emerged in the first place in global history. We're also going to look at the background, again, of slavery in human societies worldwide. Again, so this is going to be a class that is going to look at the global perspective. Okay, we're going to be looking at other cultures and other civilizations, how they also practice slavery. And of course, slavery was practiced very differently in different parts of the world. But at some point, we're going to see the emergence of a global international trade where slaves were traded as well. So Africa is going to become a major exporter of labor or slaves to the world. And we're going to take a glance at that as well. What led to that? Okay, uh, And also what led uh, the British Empire to import African slaves into their own colonies and implement this system of, uh, of labor in places like, for example, Virginia, Virginia Colony and, uh, and South Carolina. We're going to take a look at that again quite closely in this class and how the introduction of African slavery is going to shape colonial society, particularly in the South in the southern colonies. Again, we're going to see the emergence of an aristocratic society, 
an aristocratic society based upon, again, uh, a division between masters and slaves, for example. Okay, so we're going to look at that quite extensively um, in the colonial period. Uh, other topics that we're going to look at in colonial America is the topic of change. We're going to examine how the colonies were changing over time. Uh, for example, the religious colonies that I mentioned that were established by religious exiles, uh, how those colonies were becoming more and more secular over time, how religion will become quite a secondary force within those societies, and more and more, uh, the colonists are going to uh, orient their lives towards the material world. Again, becoming more and more concerned with the here and the now again. Uh, Christianity will remain really a, a very strong force within colonial society. That's for sure. But again, the religious zeal uh, is going to subside over time. So this is something that we're going to look at. And of course, there will be attempts to revive and rekindle religion. There will be religious phenomena again, that attempted to bring back that zeal in the lives and hearts of the colonists. And so that led to phenomena such as the First Great Awakening, something that we're going to actually explore quite extensively. And with that, we're going to look at not only how the colonists uh, went back to uh, the church and started uh, taking Christianity and the issue of salvation more more. Uh, more important, but also how the First Great Awakening led to the need to start converting the non-Christians in the colony, such as the African slaves. So we're going to see the massive conversion of African slaves to Christianity uh, during the First Great Awakening, and also the need to convert the Native Americans as well. Again, there will be an effort to try to convert as many Native Americans also to the Christian faith. We're going to look at that as well. Um, so besides that, we're going to look at immigration, you know, the arrival of European groups into the British colonies, most of whom are coming from uh, areas such as uh, Central Europe, Germans, for example, Scots, uh, Irish uh, will be arriving. And we're going to see the emergence of a more uh, diverse society. Again, uh, that is really not just British or even Protestant. We're going to see the introduction also of Catholicism in the colonies, and the colonies are going to become quite more diverse as well. Okay, so those are some of the issues that we're going to be dealing with. Uh, and towards the end of the colonial period, we're going to look at the American Revolution. Uh, we're looking at the reasons why the 13 colonies decided to Detached from the British Empire, we're going to look at economic factors rooted in uh, British uh, taxes, for example, uh, laws of trade regulation, and so on. We're going to look at that. But also ideas. We're going to look at the ideological factors that led to the uh, American Revolution. The Revolution were also fought not only over taxes and uh, the restrictions of trade, but also it was fought over certain new political ideas that were radicalizing the colonies as well, such as, for example, the ideas of political representation, what today we call representative government, for example, uh, or democracy for that reason. You know, today we just call it democracy. Uh, and also the idea of civil rights or uh, Back then, it was called natural rights as well. Again, so some of those ideas were novel, were new, and those are also going to inspire the colonists, again, to detach from Great Britain and create uh, an experiment, a new country that will have a very different system of government from those uh, implemented in Europe that were more monarchical, for example. You know, they wanted to experiment on, you know, with democracy. Now, the, lat the last portion of the course is going to look at the first, let us just say, 80 plus years of nationhood. 
uh, because this story ends in 1877. So after uh, the revolution with independence comes the birth of the United States. And we're going to look at the emergence of the United States, uh, the foundation, the formation of the country with the very first constitution that were written. You know, the first constitution, the Articles of Confederation, and then the Constitution of 1787 to look at what kind of country the founding fathers or the framers of those constitutions endeavor to create, how it was supposed to be structured, how was it unique or distinct, different from governments from around the world, uh, why was it considered an experiment in this case, and after that, we're going to look at how uh, that new nation, it was called a republic, the American Republic, uh, faced a series of challenges to maintain its integrity uh, and sovereignty. Again, so again, some of the, some of the issues that we're going to be dealing with again is the formation of political parties. Political parties really destabilized uh, the United States uh, initially. So we're going to be looking at that, um, and also. Uh, there will be a renewed conflict with uh, Great Britain, particularly over two issues. And the issue is over some of the lands in the Northwestern Territories, the Great Lake regions. Americans wanted to settle there. In fact, they were settling there in that area, the Great Lakes region, in those territories. And those territories were claimed by Britain and Canada. You know, Canada was part of Great Britain. And there's going to be a dispute over those territories, but also over free trade. You know, Great Britain was interfering with American trade, and that led to a new conflict called the War of 1812. Okay, we're going to also uh, assess that. Towards almost the end of the course, we're going to look at two more um, important events that um, shaped U.S. history. One of them is the Industrial Revolution. We're going to see the beginning of industrialization in the United States starting around 1816 in the Northeast, particularly in places like New England, for example, New York, Pennsylvania, Vermont. Uh, we're going to see the rise of factories. We're going to see the railroad revolution, the construction of the very first railroad, and so on. And with that, we see the emergence of a capitalist system but all of that was taking place in the northern part of the country. Again, the northern part of the country was moving towards industrial capitalism and the lives of Americans were changing rather uh, dramatically. Um, the South, instead of industrializing, as we'll see, is going to retain its traditional system of agriculture centered on plantation agriculture, growing cotton and using slave labor. Again, in order to produce the cotton as well. Um, and we're going to see the United States kind of dividing itself into two different regional economic systems. Industrial capitalism in the north and plantation agriculture with slavery in the south. And although they worked hand in hand, so to speak, they needed each other. You know, the northern textile factories in the north needed the cotton that was grown in the south. That's for sure. Uh, at some point, those two economic systems entered into a stage of Cold War competition and rivalry that ultimately led to frictions and a competition over which region was going to dominate, for example, legislation and control the federal government. And that led to finally a rupture in 1860 that produced, this is the final topic that we're going to cover, and that produced the Civil War. Again, so we're going to see the Civil War coming into being in 1860-61, and again, divided the country between the North and the South, and ultimately, uh, the South is going to lose in 1865, and after that, we see the process of reconstruction, the rebuilding of the United States, and the reunification of the country, uh, that entailed not only bringing back the South into the Union, but also changing it and reforming it. 
freeing millions of slaves and granting slave citizenship and the right to vote. We're going to be looking at that quite closely towards the end of the course. And this is a process that was uh, that ended kind of abruptly in 1877. Okay, so this is what we're going to cover. Now, I want to also uh, uh, point out that across the course, as you'll see, that this course is going to take a global perspective of history. That while you're going to be learning a great deal of material of U.S. history in this course, I mean, this is a U.S. history course, uh, you're also going to be learning uh, the history of other societies outside of the United States, particularly those that had a direct influence and effect in U.S. history. Okay, so whether we're talking, for example, about Native Americans, again, that's one aspect of looking at the global perspective. Now, you will be learning about uh, the Maya, for example, the Olmec, uh, the Toltec, the Mississippians of North America, and so on, uh, because all of them are going to have an impact in the, develop uh, the development of the United States. They contributed to a certain degree to the formation of the country. We're, you're also going to be learning about European civilization as well. Uh, you're also going to be learning about African civilizations as well, you know, because uh, as I mentioned, when we look at the slave trade, there will be significant numbers of African slaves that were introduced, that were brought into uh, the British colonies of North America. So we have to look also at their background. What was, again, Africa like, for example? What kind of cultures? Uh, existed back in Africa, particularly in West Africa. This is the region that most of the slaves that were introduced into the United States, uh, this is where the slaves came from, you know, from West Central Africa, for example. Okay, so this is something that we're going to look at quite closely uh, as we proceed across the semester. So again, it's looking at the global perspective and also that I incorporate in my lectures methods, theories, and approaches from other fields outside of history. So although this is a history course, my attempt is to bring history to life. And so this is not just, again, a course that is going to list names and dates for you to memorize, but rather we're going to talk about people, about human beings, and we have to understand them as fully as possible from the inside out, you know, try to see the world through their eyes. And one of the ways that uh, I attempt to do that is by incorporating, for example, you know, elements or theories from psychology, for example, you know, trying to psychoanalyze historical act actors, how people were thinking at a particular period of time, for example, uh, why that thinking changed over time. Um, certain leaders trying to analyze, for example, how they were raised, what kind of religion uh, was instilled in them and so on. Again, trying to understand their inner world as much as possible. So I use psychology, I use anthropology, which is the study of human cultures. I talk about religion, I go in depth about religion. So I'm not just going to list, you know, the name of the religion, I'm going to explain the religion as fully as I can. Whether I'm talking about the religion of the Europeans, the Puritans, the Quakers, the Catholics, and other Protestant groups, or the religions of the African peoples, for example, and the African slaves, or talking about the religious rituals and beliefs of the Native Americans. So again, you're going to be learning, you know, history in a more in-depth uh, and analytical way, okay? It's more and more analytical, okay, than just, again, kind of just memorizing technical information, okay? All right, so... That's as far as the course content is concerned. Now, what is going to be the mode of learning? How are you going to be learning this material? Well, as I explained at the very beginning of this uh, presentation, all my lectures have been recorded uh, using the identical program that I'm using right now. Again, uh, so they're already recorded. They're already posted on Blackboard for you to watch. And your responsibility is to be watching those lectures from now on. I know, it's try to set some time aside. Uh, you can tailor your own schedule, but uh, you have to keep a certain rhythm. 
because uh, as we'll see, the exams are all gonna be based on the lecture. So you don't need to worry about anything else. You don't need to be following, you know, readings, be reading chapters of or articles and so on. You know, your main concern is, okay, so I need to watch the lectures, take notes as thoroughly as possible, and use that information to answer the questions uh, that are presented in the exam. Okay, so that is really the key to passing and excelling this class, okay? So uh, you say, okay, so where, where, where can I find those, uh, those video lectures? When you see here this region, course content, there is here a link titled Instructional Materials. You click on that, you're gonna find two folders. The top folder is called Recorded Video Lectures, and the bottom folder, the lecture outlines and questions. Okay, so the Recorded Video Lectures folder has nine folders, and those nine folders are the nine topics we're gonna to cover across the semester. So the lectures are not given to you randomly. I'm not going from one topic to another every time you watch a video, but rather what I've done is that I've selected nine critical themes that can tell the story of United States history up to 1877. Okay, and those are listed here by numbers as you can see, and each folder or each theme has three videos. And they span about an hour and 20 minutes each. And this is more or less the time frame of a face-to-face -face, uh, in-class lecture, for example. Okay. So it's, it's almost like when you go to a campus, for example, you're taking a, a course during a regular semester, you know, those classes span about for an hour and 20 minutes. So again, uh, as you can see, you find three videos right here, and they talk, for example, about Native American history, culture, and religion. You can see session one, session two, session three. That's the order that you're supposed to be watching them. So you start first with the first topic of the semester, Native American history, culture, and religion. You watch those, you take notes, and then you proceed to look at the second topic, which is European discovery, conquest, and colonization, which also has three videos. So each theme has three recorded video lectures okay, that you must watch, okay? Now, the other folder, which says lecture outlines and questions, what those folders, what that folder contains are nine documents, and those are the outlines. So when I'm lecturing, what you're going to see on the screen is really a, an outline. Those are not the notes, okay? Don't expect that you're gonna be you know, presented with all the notes, everything that I'm saying, but rather those are bullet points of concepts, ideas, the name of certain individual and so on. So, so, so you can follow along. So it's like the train of thought. I also present charts or maps and photographs and so on, you know, to kind of animate the lecture, in other words. At the end, when you scroll the document all the way to the last page of the document, you're gonna find a series of questions. Those questions are for you to study only. Those are study questions. So those are the exact questions that will appear on the exam, okay? So I'm giving you the questions in advance, as a matter of fact, okay? So uh, that's what that folder is for. It's called Lecture Outlines and Questions, okay? All right, so going back to the syllabus, you can see here the nine topics. Again, they're uh, listed there from one to nine, and they're divided into three main areas or three main historical eras, 
know, the ancient world to the age of discovery, as I explained, there will be three topics there. And then we have the first exam. So we cover three topics, and then you're going to have a first exam based on that material. And then we proceed to the colonial period. We cover three topics, and then you have the second exam. And then we move into part three, the national period, all the way to the Civil War. And then you have the final exam. And the final exam is only going to cover uh, the material presented in the last three topics. Okay, so having said that, now let me talk about the exams because you'll probably be wondering what the exams are going to be like. Now, the exams, let me just say, are not going to contain any multiple choice questions or fill in the blank kind of questions at all. The format is quite simple, okay? And that is answering questions from one topic, and that is part one, so it's gonna have two parts. Part one, you're gonna, you're gonna be asked to choose we cover three topics. You're going to be asked to choose from one of two topics. You choose the one that you feel most confident and you answer all the questions on that topic as fully as possible. Let me give you an example, for example, here. Look at the first exam, as you can see here. This is the first exam. Okay. So again, part one, the topic section for 70 points, you say, okay, so I'm asked to choose between topic number one and two. It's either the Native Americans or the European background. Okay, so you select one topic and you answer all of the questions that are presented there as fully as possible. As fully as possible. Okay, for 70 points. Now, you don't have to write an essay composition like in English. All you need to do is follow a question and answer format. I've given you, for example, three or four questions per topic. So if you choose the Native American topic, for example, okay, so you just follow that, that guideline. You write the question, then provide the answer as fully as possible, and then write the second question, so on, so on. Again, uh, so again, you don't need to be concerned with anything else, like a superstructure, like a thesis statement, arguments, conclusion, anything like that, okay, whatsoever. Uh, the uh, part two is called key terms, but it will be more proper to call it key themes, because this is not just asking you to provide an identification of the term. It's not like a dictionary kind of definition. Okay, those are not just terms to define, but rather this is something that you really have to explain. You have to, yes, identify, but you have to describe very fully and you have to explain as well. Again, like a small theme, if you will. So a very large paragraph uh, is required for you to fully, fully elaborate on each one of those uh, themes. Uh, part two is for 30 points and is based on the third topic on religion. Um, and you have to choose three terms from a set of five, for example. You choose the, the terms that you feel most confident and you really elaborate. You really, really elaborate as fully as possible. Okay, now, having said that, let me first and foremost tell you, and this is, again, more of not just a recommendation, but a kind of like a warning, if you will, that look, uh, even though this is like an exam that you have all the time to complete, so this is not a timed exam, this is something that you do on your own, this is more like a writing assignment, in other words, okay? So it's not gonna be timed, it's not going to be scheduled to take place on a specific day and time, but, but because you have your notes at your disposal, uh, please be advised that there are certain uh, conditions you know, that students must know, you know, something that you must, must refrain from doing, for example. 
Some of them have to do with, number one, using any kind of outside source. So if I start reading your, your exam and I start noticing that there are passages, there are sentences or there's information there that was not provided in the lectures, this is something that you gather from an outside source, whatever the outside source might be, might be even from a class you took from last semester, can be from online, from, from a book, from a documentary, doesn't matter, okay? Your work will be disqualified, okay? So keep that in mind. So if you wanna pass this class, you know, and just avoid all hassles and so on, you know, just review the material, take notes, and use that information to answer the questions and also uh, the terms or the themes of part two. Okay, so refrain from using any outside source. Also, uh, refrain from just uh, transcribing the notes. Uh, some students use certain software, for example, to transcribe you know, what I'm saying in the video lectures. And what they do is that they just gather the transcription and they turn it in. You know, that's not gonna work either because you, know, you, you didn't do the work. In fact, that doesn't demonstrate that you even watch uh, the videos because maybe the computer did and the software that you used did. You know, and I can tell right away you know, when I'm actually reading that this is something that was generated by a software, in other words. So if I also notice that some software you use was doing this, can be Word or otherwise, doesn't matter. Again, there are, you know, software that students use, your work will also be disqualified. I need to really see that you watch the material, that you review that, and that you're able to put into words, into writing that, you know, by yourself, and you'll get the credit. So by using outside sources, what you're saying is that I didn't watch the videos. What I did is that I watched, you know, maybe a portion of that, but then I use other materials to answer those questions. So again, it's almost like you didn't go to class. So that's the equivalent. The equivalent is I didn't go to class, but when I got the exam, I just got the material, again, the answers from somewhere else. Again, so I cannot give you credit for that. Again, so keep that in mind. You know, uh, for the three exams given in this class are going to be identical, the identical format, but again, I need to, uh, to give you a passing grade. I need to make sure that you have reviewed this material yourself. You have watched the videos and you have understood the material by being able to answer that, again, in your own words. Okay. All right. So uh, let's continue with uh, the section of the exams. Again, they're going to be 25% each one of those exams. There's also the possibility of extra credit assignments. Uh, every student, regardless of grade standing, uh, has the opportunity to complete extra credit assignments that are already posted on Blackboard under course assignments, as you can see here. Again, when you click here and under course content, there's a link called course assignments. This again contains all of the assignments uh, that students must complete for this course. All, are, all of the assignments are required except the extra credit assignments. The extra credit assignments are optional. Okay, so only if you want extra points, again, uh, you, you will have to do those extra credit assignments. Uh, there are three. Extra credit assignments, the instructions are posted there in that folder. Uh, it comes with a reading, an article that you must read, um, and you submit it towards the end of the term. Only if you want 10 points added to each exam. And again, it doesn't matter your grade standing. Everybody is entitled to do those, okay? Now, uh, please keep in mind that for this 10-week course, Students have until July 22nd to withdraw from this course uh, without affecting their financial aid or their records. After that, uh, if you fail to withdraw after that due date, uh, you will get whatever grade you receive. Again, whatever work you turned in, etc. that's gonna be your grade, 
Okay, just keep that in mind. Uh, unless it's totally, totally out of your reach that you really cannot continue with this course, I respect your decision. But if you're falling behind, if you feel that, look, you know, something happened during the semester that maybe you need, you know, uh, uh, an extension, for example, uh, additional days to submit work, etc. Please talk to me. Send me an email before you make the decision to withdraw. Again, you have to exhaust all options and all possibilities. In other words, before making this final decision. Okay. All right, so I'm here to to help you, you know, pass this class. I'm not going to uh, give you the grade and just give it away. Uh, you have to earn it, but I'm here to guide you and provide, you know, uh, opportunities for you to improve. For example, the extra credit assignments is really a, a wonderful opportunity to improve your grades in this course. You know, it's really, again, your grades are not really set in stone. They're not. Again, you can easily improve your grades uh, across the semester. Okay. Now, I mentioned there's going to be a course assignment, and this is where the uh, textbook comes in. The textbook that for this course that is about $20, $25 new uh, is for completing this assignment, the study questions report. I've selected 10 documents from this reader. It's a reader, actually. It's a collection of historical documents. I've selected 10 documents for you to read, and uh, I have presented also a series of questions on each one of those documents. Your responsibility is to read those documents and answer those questions as fully as possible. Um, the syllabus presents all the instructions for this report. It tells you the chapter number, pages, where the, the page number for those documents, the title, and also the questions that you must answer as well. Ideally, uh, again, the format is that you write on the very top of the page the title of the document, okay? On the top of the page, you write, for example, The Origins of Disease and Medicine by James Mooney, for example. And then follow a question and answer format. Write the question and then provide the answer. Write the question, provide the answer. And then when you move to the second document, you do the same thing. Provide the title, question and answer, and so on. So also, uh, I'm expecting that the answers per document are going to spend for about a page, double space. So all the answers for the questions presented for the first document, for example, origin and disease and medicine, must be a page. Again, a page, double space. You move into the second document, all of the answers for uh, the questions of the second document must be a page, and so on. So at the end of the day, you're going to end up with a 10-page report, double space. You put a cover page, your, all your information, and you turn it in. Again, on uh, July 22nd, okay, July 22nd. All right, so um, this is 25% of the final grade. Again, so the report itself is going to be 25%, 25% of your final grade. So all combined... When you look at the major, major components of your grades for this course, it looks like this. There are four major, major works that you must complete. First, second, and final exams, 25% each, and then the study questions report, 25% each. Now, at the end of the term, when I'm calculating grades, please be advised that I take other other factors into account as well. And that is effort and progress. How do I measure that? Well, for example, I go student by student on individually. And I see that, for example, if you were progressing from the first exam, you made a 75. 
but the second exam you made an 84, and then the final exam you made a 93. That's progress. And then I see that you submitted one, maybe two extra credit assignments. That's effort. Okay, effort. You put an effort into the class because you wanted to improve your grades and so on. But despite of all of that, you ended up with an, let us just say, 89 grade average at the end of the day. Well, for me, an 89, for somebody who did extra work, like extra credit assignments and was progressing and so on, again, I just, I'll give you the final push. I'll give you the A. So that has to be rewarded as well. Again, so only if you progressed across the semester, your grades were moving upward, in other words, and you demonstrated effort to improve by completing extra credit assignments, again, that those efforts and that progress is going to be also taken into account at the end of the day, okay? Keep that in mind. The last page, uh, of the syllabus tells you week by week kind of what you should be doing. You know, what are the video lectures that I should be reviewing each week? Again, you have to keep a certain pace. I don't recommend that you leave everything at the end, you know, and attempt to watch, you know, so many videos, let, let's just say, in a couple of days. Again, it's not going to work. So if I were you, I will set some some time aside to be watching, for example, the, the Native American history video, for example, in week one, in week two, I will continue doing that and also already moving into the European, again, history. And then by the third week, I'll be moving into the third topic on religion as well, because by June 21st, you have to submit the first exam. You turn it in. Okay, so you have from now all the way to June 21st to watch the videos for the first three topics. And remember that, you know, if you paid attention to how the exams are going to be formatted and structured, well, again, you kind of, you kind of, you know, <laughs> realize that you know in reality you're just responsible for covering two topics in reality per per exam again you kind of that's the logical conclusion i mean if you really look at the actual structure of the exam so if i were you i would just apply myself to watch that material as thoroughly as possible take notes you know and you know complete the exam so they can be ready by the due date Again, uh, June 21st is the first exam. Uh, July the 12th is uh, the second exam. It covers, again, topic four, five, and six. Okay. Um, and uh, the final exam is due on August the 1st, which is going to cover the last three topics, topic uh, seven, eight, and nine. Okay. Seven, eight, and nine. Uh, all right. So this is all I have for you. I hope this was uh, helpful information, helpful uh, guidance. Again, uh, be reminded that July 22nd, again, is the last day to withdraw from this course. I just wanted to kind of uh, remind you once again of that. Uh, but all the information that you need to know is here. Uh, in the syllabus, uh, once again, uh, my name is Alfonso R. Lopez. I'll be your instructor for this class this semester. If you have any doubts, any concerns, uh, any questions, please let me know. Send me an email, and I'll be responding promptly within a 24-hour period from Monday through Friday, 48 hours uh, during the weekends. Again, uh, I hope this video presentation was very, very helpful. Um, and I expect that you have an awesome summer uh, learning, you know, new material, new information about U.S. history. This is all I have for you, and I'll see you in our next announcement. Thank you.